with all of these challenges and you know the idea of adapting your brand to another market and navigating cultural issues and legal issues and maybe even U.S. policy like you know, foreign corrupt practices or whatever it may be, um, with all of those, kind of give us the core reason that it makes sense to go overseas as a, as a franchise company. Well, there's many reasons. Number one is a, during the crisis we've had recently, you do not want to depend solely on the local market. Mm. You want to depend on a number of countries. And when you know that we have 194 countries in the world, mm -hmm. you don't want to, you want to, you want to depend on 50 countries instead of right. just one country. Right. That's one. The second thing is that the, the American, American brands are very popular internationally. Mm -hmm. And third, actually, there are the most regulated country in the world in franchising is the United States. Mm -hmm. The least regulated markets are outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. So, developing your brand in markets that do not require a huge disclosure document which costs thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. which inhibits actually many companies from outside of the United States to come to the United States mm -hmm. because of legal um, because the legal fees are high right, right. to establish the uh, disclosure documentation. So I would say there are at least mm -hmm. many elements for which a brand should go internationally. Yeah. And you've obviously worked in many places, including North Africa, but where are some of the places that we may not expect that uh, franchising is really taking root and American brands have really done well? I think right now we are living today with the misconception of the Middle East because people lump the Middle East with what's happening in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. When in fact the Middle East is a notion that a lot of people do not understand. Defining the Middle East geographically depends on where you come from. Mm -hmm. When I grew up in North Africa, we were not a Middle Eastern country. Mm -hmm. When you grew up when you grow up in the Caucasian country, if you if you if you are in the Central Central Asian countries, mm -hmm. that's to them that's the Middle East. Mm -hmm. If you are in the Gulf, they don't consider themselves as Middle Easterns, they call it the Arab Gulf. Mm -hmm. So now the, I would say one of the most profitable markets in the world mm -hmm. is the Gulf, the Gulf countries. I mean, obviously, a lot of countries, they're kind of different tiers of consumers. I mean, in most countries. And so, and, and that gap is more pronounced in, in some countries than I would expect in, in the Middle East where there's oil, the, the gap is sometimes even wider. Right. So, is there a way that you can serve a particular segment of the market even if, you know, maybe the market in general is not so adapted to... Um, to a Western brand, or you know, the, the populace in general can't necessarily. Well, a perfect, the product. a perfect example. We were talking about Egypt. Mm -hmm. Egypt is eighty, almost ninety million people, mm -hmm. and only about two percent of the people can afford really a Cinnabon. Mm -hmm. And when we took Cinnabon twenty years ago, there, not fifteen years ago, I would say right now, we would, we would never, we never thought that the brand would do so well. Mm -hmm. When in fact the brand did better than most countries in the world mm. because the response to the brand has been very different. If you based it on per capita, mm -hmm. you, would be, you would be making the wrong assumption. Mm -hmm. The same thing with Honduras. It's a very small country, but consumers love American brands and American brands have done very well mm -hmm. despite being in a very poor country. Right. So how do you do that homework and then what are some of the models that companies may use uh, when they go overseas? Typically, what you, there is a, uh, a tendency for developing countries mm -hmm. to be very um, to have to view American brands as very popular mm -hmm. and as good investments. You avoid Western Europe because labor mm -hmm. and real estate are very high. Mm -hmm. You go to countries that are not very developed. Mm -hmm where there is an entrepreneurial flair, where people are thinking that at this, I'm going to take an American brand and I'm going to grow it here mm. and it's going to work. You go to Eastern Europe, you go to Asia, you go to the Middle East, mm -hmm. you go to Latin America, mm -hmm. Caribbean, and you do well. I, I see a conflict here though, which is that most of the markets that you said to avoid are the ones that people here would be probably most comfortable with. <laughs> so, the, the, the uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, well, and and so how do you how do you make that case, and how do you um, you know help help the uh, the American company that may be a little bit skeptical about the opportunities in other markets, and tell them, hey, you need to go to you know somewhere like Tunisia to, that to, they've never to, heard of. Well, 
we don't really tell them to go to Tunisia, but we tell them to go to, to developing countries, right. emerging countries. Uh -huh. The, when, when you say something like that, you've got to substantiate it, and the way to substantiate it is to provide facts. Mm. And the facts have shown over the years that American brands have done much better in developing countries, mm -hmm. especially medium companies, the major companies like mm -hmm. McDonald's, KFC, mm -hmm. Pizza Hut, they've gone to more mm -hmm. developed countries because they created, they actually invested locally themselves. Right. So Bashir, tell us about some of your clients. I know that we, we've talked about developing countries and the fact all the promise that they have for uh, U.S. companies. Um, you've been involved in kind of helping those countries establish the structures by which franchising is governed. So I'd be, I'd be interested to hear um, your story on that. It's true that typically we represent American brands and Canadian brands developing internationally, but sometimes also the government comes to us and say, we would like to task you to go to a specific country, in this case mm -hmm. it was Tunisia, to help them create an infrastructure for franchising, both from the legal and commercial point of view. And I've traveled there about five times before the revolution and after the revolution to be an advisor to the government about creating their laws and regulations to make sure that they have the right infrastructure to promote franchising to Tunisia. Mm -hmm. And this is with the Department of Commerce? This is with the Department of Commerce. I'm actually now, I am an expert in residence for the Department of Commerce in terms of franchising internationally. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the challenges or some of the misconceptions that those other countries have when you go in and speak with them about how the U.S. market works? Well, the first assumption is they do, they are very afraid of having franchisor come and dominate their industry. Mm -hmm. And they are very afraid. So they tend to legislate in a very defensive manner. And what I, my advice to the government then was to make sure to let experience guide your legislation and not mm. the other way around. Mm. And not borrow concepts from other countries such as in the case of Tunisia, it was France. Mm -hmm. Because France had its own idiosyncratic right. way of getting to that legislation mm -hmm. and they had a very tough law regulating yeah. franchising and, and I was afraid that they might just freely borrow from mm -hmm. the legal concepts that yeah. are inherent to France. Mm -hmm. And I asked them to really be careful about that because you could be hampering your efforts to promote franchising to foreign franchisors coming to the country. Mm -hmm. 